Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think we are ready to begin, inshallah. Um, I think most of the participants have joined. And um, tonight we'll be covering the second lesson for uh, for uh, the unlocking course, um, Duties Muslims Out of the Quran. Uh, and Sister Sadia will be delivering the presentation. Just a reminder that um, uh, the presentation will be for about 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, and we'll follow with questions uh, or comments thereafter. Uh, people are just reminded that uh, for the question time, uh, please use the uh, um, raise your hand option or button on the on the Zoom uh, functionality, uh, and uh, we will take uh, questions in uh, the order in which the hands are raised, inshallah. Uh, so to begin, uh, Sister Sadia, you can take over and uh, begin the presentation. Jazakallah khair. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. I seek refuge in Allah against Shaitan the Rejected, and I begin with the name of Allah, the eternal source of mercy and grace. I greet you with the universal greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A very warm welcome to all our participants for lesson two of the Quran 101 course. Last night, we covered the purpose of the Qur'an. And today we will be covering the duties Muslims owe to the Qur'an. Now, after last night's session, I do hope that we have all made a conscious resolution that we will not be amongst those whom Allah's Rasul complains about on the Day of Judgment when he says, Ya Rabbi, Oh my Rabb, my people have distanced themselves from the Qur'an. Now before I proceed with the main points of tonight's presentation, let us quickly analyze the term Fard. Now when you hear the term Fard, what comes to your mind? Probably things like Salah, fasting, Hajj, charity, etc. But let us explore what else is Fard. So I would like you to look at Surah 28, Ayah 85. Yesterday there was a request for a page number. Unfortunately, I cannot give you the page references for all the different translations of the Quran. So those of you that want to refer to it, it will be on page 1026. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alladhi farada alayka al-Qur'an. Verily he, Allah, ordained the Qur'an for you. So here we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the Qur'an obligatory. Now when something is obligatory, what does it mean? We have to carry it out. It becomes mandatory. It is a duty. So now that we have a wider perspective of what is fard, we can proceed. And I'm going to highlight the duties or the obligations that we owe to the Quran. There are five such duties. Our first obligation to the Qur'an is to believe and to have conviction that the Qur'an is of divine origin. In other words, it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to believe that it is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through the angel Jibreel. Now to have faith in the divine of origin of the Qur'an means that we should not only verbally profess it, but our actions should testify to such belief. In Surah 2, Ayah 285, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, and this verse is on the screen. It's also a very popular verse. It's uh, amongst the verses at the end of Surah ba uh, Baqarah. Amen al rasul bima unzila ilayhi min rabbihi wal mu'minun. The messenger believed in what was revealed to him from his Lord, and so do the believers. 
This obligation is further motivated in Surah 47, which is Surah Muhammad, ayah number 2, on page 1378. وَآمَنُوا بِمَا نُفْذِلَ Muhammad, And believe in the revelation sent down to Muhammad, وَهُوَ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِ For it is the truth from their Lord. So from here we see that the belief to believe that the Quran is of divine origin should be accompanied also by a testification of such belief. Of course, we cannot be satisfied with just believing in it. We have to go beyond this. And this brings us to the second obligation we owe to the Quran, and that is to read and study it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Baqarah, Ayah 121, on page 51. Those to whom we have sent the book, study it or make tilawat as it should be studied. They are the ones that have Iman in it. So how do we prove or manifest our Iman? What would be the litmus test or what, what is the practical test for the profession of this Iman? And the practical test would be the reading or the studying of Revelation. Now let's talk a little about the term Tilawat. Tilawat means to read so you understand what you are reading. So we need to read it slowly and thoughtfully. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, in Surah 73, Ayah 4, page 1632, and recite the Quran in slow, measured, rhythmic tones. Here, the term tartil implies to read in well apportioned stages. In other words, slowly enough so as to absorb its meaning. Now, certainly the Quran is not a book that you could just read once only. It has to be read over and over again. So we have to engage with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly in our lives because this is the gift of Allah's speech to us. Our third obligation is to understand and comprehend the Holy Quran. We must seek to understand its message with an open heart and mind. Now, of course, there are numerous grades of comprehension that would be accessible to different persons according to their respective planes of intellect and consciousness. So there are two important terms here. The one is that of tadakkur and the other tadabbur. Now let's take the first one. The first stage in the comprehension of the Qur'an is called Tadakkur. Tadakkur comes from the word Dhikr, which means to take heed or to be mindful. The teachings of the Qur'an have been rendered easy by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for gaining this level of guidance. So in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats this four times in the same surah. And we have indeed made the Qur'an easy to understand and remember, then is there any that will receive admonition? And um, in yesterday's presentation, Sister Maimuna also referred to this first from um, Surah 54, verse, verses 17, 22, 32, and 40. Actually, it's a refrain that occurs in Surah Kamar. So the point emphasized here is that the Quran is easy to understand. You don't need to study any rocket science to get the basic message and to follow the practical guidance of the Quran. The second level of understanding is the Dabbur. So about the Dabbur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 47, Ayah 24, Afala yatadabbarun al-Quran. Do they not earnestly seek to understand the Qur'an? Am ala kulubi akfaluha? 
or are their hearts and minds locked up by them? Now, this is actually the slogan verse for this cause of Quran 101. This verse also gives us an indication of who is the true prisoner and what is the way in which we can free ourselves. And if we look even at the, uh, if we look at the early Muslims at the time when they received the revelation, we can see the impact that the Quran had in freeing them or liberating them from Jahiliya. So the Quran is a tool for our liberation. Tadabur is described as an intense reflection and a penetrating study of the Quran, diving deep into the ocean of its wisdom. It is a lifelong task. There is no end to it. It's about deducing solutions for problems and applying the Quran to present times. So one can compare this to an ocean. Some people will be satisfied with just picking up the pebbles and the shells at the shore, and others will want to dive deeply for the pearls. Now, there are many ways to begin your study of the Quran. You can do it from cover to cover. You can start with selected surahs, like the ones that are very often recited, like Surah Yasin, Surah Mulk, or you can even start with the stories of the prophets. And if we look at the number of translations that are available today, there is absolutely no excuse. Our fourth obligation is to act upon its teachings. The Quran constitutes guidance for mankind, Linnas. The potential of this book can only be fully realized when people act upon its teachings. So at an individual level, it is imperative for us to mold our characters and our lives according to the teachings of the Quran. And this is actually how we will follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Because the Prophet Sallallahu is very often referred to as the walking Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in Surah 6, Ayah 155. And this is a book which we have revealed as a, as a blessing. So follow it and be righteous. لَأَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ That you may receive mercy. So if you don't follow the book, if we refuse to follow the revelation, then how can we expect the mercy? And if we ignore or disregard the injunctions of the Quran, then the reading and the understanding will be of no value. At the collective level, we would apply the principles of the Quran to establish social and economic justice. Now, if we look at the Ummah today, we find that it is facing a tremendous number of challenges. On the one side, we have illiteracy. Illiteracy is actually a major problem in the Muslim countries. Then on the other side, we have poverty, unemployment, civil wars, ethnic conflict, violation of human rights, lack of political transparency, racism, gender violence, and sometimes simply a lack of human development. So on the collective level, we need to apply the principles of the Quran to address these issues. Okay, another point that uh, I would like to bring up here is the parable of the menu. It's helpful to look at the Quran as a manual which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for us with instructions of how to operate our lives. Now today, whenever we purchase a machine, a car or an appliance, 
It's usually accompanied by a manual containing instructions for the user. Now imagine trying to use an appliance if the manual is in Chinese or another language that you're not familiar with. Obviously, if you don't follow the instructions, then the machine or the appliance will not be able to operate properly. Now, who is qualified to write this manual for mankind? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created mankind and thus he is best qualified to provide the manual. So if we do not follow the instructions in this manual, if we do not follow the guidance, the laws, the directives, but rather follow our own whims and desires, then we will have disorder in our lives. And that is why we have all these problems in society today. So finally, we come to our the fifth obligation we owe to the Quran, and that is to teach it to others. So if you refer to Surah 50, Ayah 45, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So admonish with the Quran such as fear my warning. So initially, this was the responsibility of the Prophet who fulfilled his obligation by conveying the divine message to the Ummah. But now it is our duty to proclaim this message. And the Quran gives us lots of direction and advice with regard to the methodology to use. We have to propagate the message with wisdom and beautiful teaching, and of course, with, by means of example. So we have to make an earnest effort to educate our friends, families, children, and communities. It has actually become a matter of urgency. We have to create a generation that is Quranically literate. But how can we propagate this message of the Quran if we ourselves choose to remain ignorant of it? So to summarize tonight's session, there are five obligations we owe to the Quran. Firstly, a Muslim is required to believe in the Quran. And we said that this does not have to be restricted to just an abstract belief. We are required to read it. The two important terms here were tilawat and tartil. Thirdly, we need to understand it. And here we spoke about tadakkur and tadabur as the two levels of understanding. Fourthly, we have to act upon its teachings. That means we have to apply its principles to all the different dimensions of our lives. And finally, we are required to convey its teachings to others, that is to make dawah with the Quran. So in conclusion, dear participants, let us do some introspection. How much time do we spend with the Quran? What is our general excuse? We are too busy. What does busy mean? Busy means we are doing something that we think is more important. Consider how much we read every day. News, books, all our, don't even talk about all our WhatsApp messages and emails. University students sometimes reading books as thick as the yellow pages. In our lives, we make time slots for everything. Eating, sleeping, work, recreation, gym, functions. Okay, that's some of it is out now because of lockdown. But do we have a fixed slot in our lives for the Quran? Isn't this a reflection of what importance we have attached to it? How much do we value the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do we revere the Quran? 
Do we just wipe off the dust and put it on a high shelf and bring it down for Ramadan and funerals? Or have we made it a top priority in our lives? I would like to end off with the question. Are we fulfilling this fard which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained? Shukran. Jazakallah, Sister Saria.